Hello, everybody. Um, Oreo and I are going to do introductions on our guest speaker. So it is my great pleasure to introduce my friend, uh, Dr. Andrew Papakristos. Dr. Papakristos is currently a professor of sociology at Northwestern University and the director of the Northwestern Neighborhood and Network Initiative. Dr. Papakristos' main research applies network science to the study of gun violence, police misconduct, um, Ill uh, illegal gun markets, Al Capone, street gangs, and urban neighborhoods. Dr. Papakristos is actively involved in policy-related research, including the evalu evaluation of gun violence prevention programs in more than a dozen cities. Uh, Dr. Papakristos has authored more than 50 articles, and his work has appeared in top journals such as the American Sociological Review, the Journal of Criminology, and the J American Journal of Public Health. Uh, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to our, our guest speaker. And I'll, I'll thank him for his time for zooming in and give, giving a talk. Fantastic. Well, thank you for, for having me. Um, you know, I'm excited to uh, be here today and kind of present some of the work uh, that my team and I have been working over actually over the last three or four years. And so um, if you just give me a moment, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen uh, using a little bit of a new piece of technology for me, if you bear with me as I do this. But um, Basically, one of the things we've been looking at over the last several years has been um, trying to understand the idea of police misconduct in a different way than we usually think about it. And first, let me do the, something I should always do at the beginning of a talk, which is recognize all of my co-authors. Uh, and to the extent that there are any problems with the work we're doing, I blame all of them. Uh, but more seriously, it's a group of scholars former students, current students, colleagues, um, sort of from around the country, and I, I couldn't do this work without them. But one of the things that we really have been trying to do is think about the current moment that we're in. As we think about conversations around policing and conversations around police violence, and we see the images over and over again and the sort of mo moment of national reckoning we're having with police violence, uh, which is how do we explain these things? How do we explain uh, our, what are our theories of police misconduct? And on the one hand, we often think about bad apples, right? And we think about the proverbial bad police officer. Uh, we have lots of research that suggests that uh, there are a small number of police officers that are responsible for a large number of behaviors. On the other end of the uh, spectrum, we talk about the systemic problems and the history of policing, the racialized history of policing, its origins, and kind of where we are today as a reflection of those origins uh, of policing and what, it, and what it means in that kind of context. There's actually something in the middle, of course, which are what I'm gonna talk about, about networks. And for those of you that remember things like the Rampart scandal in Los Angeles uh, or the Ryder scandal in, in um, Oakland or even in Chicago, there's all sorts of examples of these cliques and crews and something more than individuals, but something not quite the whole department uh, of bad police officers. And the Rampart scandal, for those of you that don't know, was about 70 or so officers in Los Angeles that started their own street gang within the LAPD. And they were responsible for hundreds and hundreds of instances of police misconduct and violence. And they were robbing people and they were sort of doing all of the worst things uh, that, could, that could kind of happen sort of in this kind of context. So how do we and where do we think through and explain these sorts of behaviors. And that's really what I'm going to talk a little bit about today. And, and in fact, I'm going to show you a few different parts of our work um, and thinking through what these things will, will mean. Uh, but we're going to ask a couple of different questions. And so what I'm going to talk about today are social networks. This idea that networks themselves, and by networks here, I don't just mean, uh, I don't just mean uh, social media. I'm talking about the relationship between people the people you're connected to and how that affects what you feel, think and do. And really just important to understand that we live in a networked world. Who we're connected to affects what we, who we vote for, what we buy, who we marry, our ideas, our neighbors, our school. We have a whole field of network science and then I'm gonna hope to try to apply that to police misconduct. So I'm gonna look at three different questions. The first thing I'm gonna look at is, what is the network structure of police misconduct? Is it a group thing or is it just a bunch of bad apples? And what does that mean? Then I wanna talk about what's the impact uh, of social of networks on police violence and problem behaviors, excuse the typo here, right? So we wanna see, is it a network thing at all? 
one impact does it have on, on police violence and police behavior, which then of course leads us to this last kind of question, which will probably lead the discussion, which is how, what does this mean at this moment of reckoning we're having in this country about how we reimagine or reinvent or redefine policing in this country? So let me spend a minute if I, if, if I can to talk about the data that we're gonna use. So the huge downside of doing these things online, and there are many, is that as soon as I start telling you about the data, you're gonna quickly go look up the data online. But let's talk about the problem of studying policing, right? It is a closed network. It is a closed group. It's hard to get access to policing. It's hard to do field work on cops. Cops themselves are not allowed to talk to the press, for example, without the explicit permission of their supervisors. And there is this code of silence, this blue brotherhood. So, so trying to study policing from a sociological perspective can be quite difficult, right? So how do we do that? There are a couple of ways we've done this historically, surveys, we've done ethnographies, but I'm gonna be using a very unique set of data. And here's the part where I do not want you to Google the Invisible Institute. But when you are done here, please go Google the Invisible Institute, my partner on this project. They're a journalistic enterprise in the South side of Chicago, responsible for breaking the cases of Laquan McDonald and others. And what they have done on this citizen data project, which you should all go check out, is they have FOIA'd and made public every single citizen complaint against the Chicago police officer for the last 30 years. Tens and thousands of complaints. It's on a database. You can download the data. You can analyze the data. And I've known this organization for a long time since I lived on the South Side. And so when they started doing this project, we started partnering up again. But when you go to the Invisible Institute's website, and you look at stuff, you will see an interface that looks like this. You can look up particular officers, Officer Andy, and it will give you information about that officer, such as how many complaints he was involved with, in this case, 36, with how many different officers, in this case, 12. And that's a network. I know whom Officer A was doing bad things with, and I can create and string these data together. So if John and I are two police officers and we were uh, uh, subject to a complaint, we have a tie. And if John and Michelle were on a different complaint, they have a tie. And literally what I'm doing is transforming these data to link individual officers through complaints, literally the bad behavior network that they're involved with. Right, And you can do this over time, over space, over people's entire careers. And we've taken a deep dive looking exactly at these sorts of data. I'm gonna, this is a, a, huge, uh, a huge set of data. And then today I'm gonna look at specifically at a subset of this data for about a six year period in which we have the cleanest, uh, most, uh, most complete set of data. It's about 20,000 complaints in which I have full officer information, full information about the event. And in our various papers, we kind of use extensions of these data or subsets of these data. But today I'm gonna to look at these sorts of complaints. So let's talk about one other hugely important distinction, which is a complaint that's filed from a civilian against an officer as compared to one that one cop files against another cop, right? They actually mean quite two different things, right? So one is sort of uh, being, being complained against by a peer, the other is being complained against by a, ci a civilian, which is usually the former, the civilian initiated that uh, most uh, especially public debates are about. They're really about how police are interacting with civilians. But this latter behavior also becomes interesting and important, right? And I'm gonna talk about both of them and I'm gonna distinguish between both of them. So let me start with the first question. Is police misconduct is it actually a sort of group behavior? And what I'm gonna tell you quickly, the short answer there is yes. And let me kind of show you a couple of figures. So right here, there's a lot going on, but if you look on the left-hand side in the bar charts, on the top, it shows civilian complaints, the bottom shows departmental complaints. And what this basically shows you is the number of officers named on complaints. For civilian complaints, almost uh, only 45%, name a single officer, which means the vast majority of complaints that civilians file are against multiple officers, at least two. And the same thing is true on the bottom, though slightly less so, which is most departmental complaints are filed against not one, but groups of officers. So it is a group thing, and in part because the structure of policing, especially in Chicago, is group-based. You're almost always with a partner. You very rarely police on your own in Chicago, though that's not true in other cities. 
On the right hand side, you see this thing that we call degree distribution, which is how many complaints do officers kind of have on general or on average. And what you see is most officers over the course of their career have one or two complaints, which is the vast majority of officers, 80%, have fewer than three or four complaints over their whole career. And most of these complaints, to be clear, are not for excessive use of force or some kind of civil rights violation. Most complaints tend to be procedural in nature, which doesn't make them any less you know, bad, but they're potentially less damaging. But the bottom line is most cops, uh, or, or rather a lot of behaviors driven by the tail of a distribution. Most complaints are driven by a small number of officers. But we're gonna come back to that in just a second. Right here is the baddest apple in the Chicago Police Department, who over the course of his career from the late 1980s to the mid 2010, 2015, had 132 complaints, uh, allegations actually. Uh, and in fact, when you look at, again, all of this is available from the Invisible Institute, but was in the 99th percentile for allegations and the 95th percentile of use of force, had 21 use of force reports filed against this person. 12 of these, by the way, were sustained. So this is an officer who you don't need an algorithm to predict, by the way. I'm just illustrating that tail end of the distribution. And these officers, one of the things I'm gonna show you is that these officers, these bad apples, play an extremely important role in for how misconduct looks and works in a city like Chicago. So what does the network look like? I've been talking about these networks. Well, here's a network in one police district. And in Chicago, there are 22 of these things. Let's focus on the civilian facing network. Here's the thing about these networks. Every one of those dots, every single one of those dots is an individual police officer, a real police officer. And the ties are the instances of complaints. And so what you see, again, focusing on the civilian side, you see a bunch of dots without any ties, or you see a bunch of dots with one tie. And those are your typical officers, but you see this constellation in, in the sort of right side of that figure, civilian facing figure, this large network. And that is a literal network of bad police officers. And what holds that together are those high activity officers, those highly uh, problematic officers will hold this thing together, not just for a single district, but for the entire city of Chicago. And so what you're looking at here is a single network of about 4,600 police officers 4,600 police officers. And it's absolutely true that in this case, these 4,600 police officers, there are a bunch of different sub clicks and crews. And I'll come back to that in just a little bit. But the different coloring in this graph behind me here is showing you different regions, different clusters. For those of you that do clustering algorithms, these are literally detecting communities of bad police officers, crews of bad police officers. But 4,600 officers is a lot of officers. For scale, there are about 13,000 police officers in the city of Chicago, and 4,600 of them we can find in this sort of network. One of the things we learned very quickly as well is we're trying to figure out why exactly are, you know, what's, what's predicting who gets a complaint. And some of this we know from other research as well. When we look at comparing male and female officers, Female officers get far fewer complaints from civilians, as well as fewer complaints from the department, right? And we know this. Actually, female officers also have less charges for use of force um, and, and make far fewer problematic arrests. When we look at race and ethnicity, from civilian st standpoint, uh, Black, Hispanic, and white officers get complaints at roughly the same level once you control for a whole bunch of other things, right? But from a departmental perspective, actually black cops get more departmental complaints, suggesting they might in fact be uh, experiencing work, some workplace discrimination, which is from civilians, they're getting the same sorts of levels of, of complaints, but from their own department, people are complaining more against black officers. The next sort of question you wanted to ask was, what predicts who you do bad stuff with? Why do I choose to engage in misconduct with John, but not Michelle? And we ran a series of uh, what are known as uh, Bayesian exponential random graph models. That's a mouthful. We just say Burgums. But literally what this ends up looking like is a logistic regression that tries to predict the probability of why I form a tie with John and not Michelle. 
And we look at all sorts of effects, age, race, gender, uh, homophily. Do you, are you more likely to form a tie with someone who's the same race or gender, your years on the force? And we do this for about, we do essentially every, every one of the 22 districts uh, and we do it 10,000 times for each of these sorts of districts for both civilian and departmental complaints. Some 44,000 models we run to try to get these estimates. And perhaps the most striking difference that we see, the one that is that holds in almost all of our models is this one around difference in tenure, right? Which is when we think about differences in tenure, this is about cops that are paired together with younger and older police officers. And what we see when we look at difference in 10 years, when you do that, when you have younger and older or less experienced and more experienced officers, you have significantly far fewer complaints, right? So that mismatch is really important, even net of just in general tenure on the job. When we start to look at other things, black officers uh, named in a complaint, black officers actually get are less likely to be named in a complaint in general relative to white or Latino officers. But when they are named in complaints, they're more likely to be named when they're partnered with another black officer. Again, suggesting that there's something that could be happening that when two officers are paired together, they draw more complaints, right? I can't distinguish to whether or not black officers change their behaviors when they're paid, paired together, or they're more likely to engage in misconduct with someone they trust, who tends to be somebody who's more like them, or conversely, if people experience two black officers together as doing something wrong, which would be the same sort of uh, stereotyping of just young black groups of young black men in general. We could be seeing that being uh, leveled against police officers themselves. So this next kind of question we're really interested in asking is, well, what does this have to do? Is it, is it in a sense contagious? Does what is what's happening to my fellow officers affect what's happening to me, right? And so to do this, what we did for every single one of those dots that was in that big network I showed you, we looked at say what we call their ego network. So imagine that you are ego in this figure and A, B and C are your partners at time one. And then at time two, you have another new partner, D and C. And then at time three, you have another new partner, E, right? So your ego network are the people around you. And what we wanted to look at was what happened when the people around you start to engage in excessive use of force? What happens to your behavior? Do you start to adapt your behavior? That's exactly what we found, which is you start to adapt patterns of use of force similar to your peers. And in fact, it's a fairly consistent curve, which is as your exposure to use of force goes up, excuse me, as your peers use of force behavior goes up, so too does your use of force behavior. We also found a very important mitigating factor, which is the percentage of your partners and peers that were women. So not only do female officers have fewer use of force complaints, they actually dampen and lessen use of force of their partners, right? So again, to repeat that, female officers actually have a mitigating effect on use of force, even among their male peers, which is a hugely important finding. We wanted to ask a slightly different question about the most extreme use of force among police officers, which is which officers actually shoot? Which officers fire their weapons? You know, out of these 4,600 officers in this particular case, how do we figure out which ones are the ones that are gonna draw their weapon and shoot at a civilian? Now, I do wanna make uh, an important distinction, which is one of the things that we're uh, tried to do when we were doing this sort of work. And it's, it's important for understanding where things are going is we looked at not just any officer who fired their weapon. I mean, there are cases in which firing their weapon is considered legally justified. We actually looked at a subset of officers who fired their weapon first without being injured or threatened or without the suspect having a weapon themselves. So these were officers that literally drew their firearm, shot at a suspect, shot at a civilian before any other thing sort of happened. So it's a very small segment of the population of police officers that even shoot their weapons. But really important, which cops do that? And our hypothesis was going to be, it were these officers that were in between spaces of the network. They're brokers. How did they become brokers? One of the ways officers become brokers is they get moved around. They go from district to district. And when they go from district to district, now that we're all living in the COVID moment, we understand super spreaders, right? 
brokers are potentially super spreaders because if you look at uh, person B here in this particular uh, graph, person B is sitting between two different sets of say germs, if you will, right? And A is also exposed to both sides of this graph. They're proximate to all sorts of bad behaviors. And so we hypothesized consistent with all other sorts of network research that brokers were gonna be people who were especially interesting, which is exactly kind of what we found in this model. And so one of the things we started to see and find was that at baseline, officers that were brokers had a, almost a 30% higher log odds of shooting, controlling for everything else, right? Again, the biggest effect is gender, but everything else, years on the force, age, prior complaints, all of these sorts of things, really your position in the network is extremely, extremely important for whether or not you're going to shoot. And that becomes really important because these are things we can see. These are things structurally. Remember, policing our hierarchy. I tell you to go someplace, you go someplace. If you can understand and see this structure, it might offer an interesting point of sort of intervention. This comes back to where I started with some of the rampart ideas. What happens when you're more than just one bad cop? What happens when you're a cluster or crew of bad police officers? And one of the things we've started to do is look and ask exactly that kind of question. So we wanted to think about how can we find and detect bad police officers that are more than just themselves? And just to give you an example, this is Sergeant Ronald Watts. And Sergeant Watts ran a team of police officers, uh, about 20 or so officers in one of the housing projects in Chicago. They were robbing drug dealers. They were implicated in several murders. They were selling drugs. They were planting evidence. They were doing the most horrific elements of misconduct that you could think of. And we asked ourselves if we knew Ronald Watts' network, if we could draw it, if we could map it, can we look for other sorts of patterns within that big network that you just saw? Could we identify other teams that looked like Watts, other crews of cops? And that's exactly what we set out to do. And so what we did was we took Watts and we took a few other police uh, crews that we found, the Austin 7, uh, you know, some of the John Burge cases in Chicago, if you're familiar with it, and we created an index right? And it's essentially sort of a community detection uh, method that we used. We you took these five variables you see on the screen to create an index, uh, and we sort of had to make a decision. And so if you had an index over this threshold, we, we just called you a crew. I should say we did this iteratively with the Invisible Institute, which is to say, we generated these crews, we went back and said, hey, does this look like a crew to you? Does this look like a crew to you? And uh, they would say yes. And then we would kind of fine tune this algorithm. And we actually found 160 different crews in this network. And here's what's kind of shocking about this. Oh, apologies, I, uh, I lost my slide here for a second. But um, this crew, these 160 crews were responsible for 25% of all civilian generated complaints, 20% of all shootings, police involved shootings, and 15% of all complaints filed by black civilians. They were responsible for a large part of the mass incarceration we experienced in Chicago, 160 crews of cops, less than, a, less than 900 or so police officers were responsible for a massively disproportionate amount of sort of, uh, of police misconduct in the city and the incarceration of the individuals uh, who, were, who were involved in these sorts of things. So, I kind of just want to wrap up with a few key points. Apologies for the mishap. Well, what does this mean? Where are we going with the research? But also, what does this mean more generally for what we're going to talk about? And so, um, you know, I think one of the things that we're thinking about as we kind of um, proceed in this work and kind of continue on with thinking about what we're going to do is it does let us pinpoint with some degree of accuracy, cops that are involved in a range of bad behaviors, but actually they're involved in the shootings of civilians, 
the robbing of civilians, like they're involved in a huge thing. So we can identify them. We know who they are. We know who their partners are. We also can kind of start to map and look at their careers, which is one of the things that we also started to do to look at when do officers essentially go over some sort of tipping point to become bad officers. And conversely, we're looking for officers that go through their whole career without having a single complaint. Where are those officers? What are they doing? Are they in positions to intervene? Are they in positions where they should be leaders or field training officers or things like that? So we're trying to start to think about now how and what these sorts of findings can be used to mitigate harm. It does not solve the sort of um, the history of policing, but it can actually stop some of the bad behaviors while we, while we wrestle with a lot of these bigger conversations about which are fundamentally what role should police have sort of in the current, uh, in the current state of America. Um, I could go on, but I'd be more excited to engage some kind of questions. I also have a pocket full of other slides that I'm happy to dig into uh, at any sort of given moment. So. Let me, let me stop there and, and turn it back over to John and Michelle. Hello, uh, well, thank you very much. Um, at this point, uh, if you have any questions, please put them in the, in the Q&A box. I think that means you got to go first, John. Oh, um, oh here we go. Uh, uh, I have a, a question for you, saved by the bell. Um, <laughs> have you shared your research with uh, with police departments? What is what does law enforcement uh, uh, feel about this uh, research? That is a great question. So the answer to that question is, are you talking about police leaders? Are you talking about police rank and file? Or are you talking about police unions? So the answer is yes. I've shared with multiple police uh, departments and police executives. Police executives uh, love it. Um, and the reason they love it is because they actually want to fire cops. <laughs> so you know, in most cases, most police leaders, most superintendents, most chiefs of police um, really want to make the case of something that they know, which is there are problem officers. Part of the reason cops get shuffled to my, to my point about these brokers are cops that have been passed around. The reason they get shuffled is because they can't be fired. And if John is a really problem officer, the only way I can deal with him is to give him to somebody else, right? And so when you ask police executives, they see this and they're like, this is what, uh, this is sort of what we want to think about. And we need to help us make our strategic decisions about how to, how to get rid of officers. That brings me to the second sort of bucket, which are police unions. Police unions, by and large, as you might expect, hate it, right? Because um, they are so uh, wed to the bad apple mode of thinking that once you show them it's something more than a bad apple, they don't know what to do with it. And their priority is keeping people employed contrary to anything else. On the ground cops, I, they love it too. But the reason they love it is because it verifies what they experience, right? And so every time I've shown this to sort of rank and file cops, they're like, oh, well, then here's what you need to do to fix it. And they start going into all these things that they wish people would listen to because nobody ever listens to their ideas, right? Um, you know, or usually they complain because they know that when Michelle and John are paired together, they know it's trouble, right? And so they don't want Michelle and John to be paired together because they're tired of cleaning up their messes. So they also see it as a validation of what they're seeing on the ground. The first time I showed this in the class, I had a student who was a very good student. She started texting furiously in her, uh, in her phone and like she looked all, all bothered and she came up to me afterward and she showed me her phone and her dad was an LA uh, police detective and she was like, could you believe this guy? He was, he was, you know, talking about blah, 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 blah. And her dad's text back was, look, it wasn't exactly training day, the movie, but it was kind of like that, right? Which is every cop will tell you their first thing, first day on the job, some other cop comes up to them and says, forget everything you learned in the academy. Here's real policing. And so in general, that's continued to be my response. Cops live in these networks. Uh, they see these networks and they really do, um, you know, think about 
how those networks could be improved. Great, we have a couple more coming in. Um, Sam asks, uh, ha uh, how have your results shaped your suggestions for departments being defunded or dismantled? Does that fit anywhere into that conversation? Yeah, so it's an interesting, it's a great question. And obviously the current debate about how we reimagine policing, I mean, really the question, the biggest question is, you know, what should community safety look like and what role, if any, should the police play? Um, you know, as we think about, and we're involved in all sorts of these discussions with other projects as well as sort of this project. I mean, the first thing it would suggest is thinking about, you know, especially what you're spending money on. One of the things that we didn't, I didn't talk about today is those same officers, by the way, they're responsible for the millions of dollars of city payouts that are paid by civilians and taxpayers every year. And so literally in Chicago, there's three to five million dollars every year paid out to uh, people who file complaints for this really bad behavior by those police officers of taxpayer dollars. You know what you could do with that $5 million instead of having these bad cops doing bad behaviors? You could give it to non-police violence prevention initiatives. So one of the things this could inform, and I think believe it should be the case, is thinking about well, which officers should be promoted, which officers should be get gotten rid of, and in fact, which are the actual sort of uh, officers that would be would be there. It does also shake up this idea that it's just bad apples, right? And so the network perspective is always going to be right between individuals and and macro level forces. Networks is where the real world plays out, right? And so it it, it sort of gets rid of this idea that policing is just a just a couple of bad apples. It's something bigger than that. Right, and it acknowledges that these networks are built by the, the sort of racist history of policing. And if you wanna do something about that system, you need to shake it up, you need to break it apart. And there are ways to do that and still maintain public safety, which would require a much longer conversation about how this would relate with other sorts of networks, violence prevention efforts in the city. Okay, Grace has a question. Um... Do you think that disciplining these bad apples uh, could have an influence on future behaviors in a similar way as their behaviors did on those in their network? And then part two would be, do you think there is a mode of discipline punishment that would work best? Yeah, so the important thing around misconduct and use of force is um, things like shootings and use of force are the smallest part of bad police behavior. And so there, part of what I think it could be best utilized for is expanding this to understand the trajectory of bad behaviors, uh, especially among other parts of information that we have of officers, right? So looking for patterns that say, hey, Andy's starting to go down this path, you can have an intervene and, and come back on. I think those sorts of things would absolutely be true. And you definitely want to do that before, long before an officer would be on the path towards uh, you know, doing something as serious as engaging in physical harm of a civilian. Um, I think it also, and part of the thing that's important to understand about policing is it can also help for the mental health and trauma of police officers themselves, right? Police officers have astronomically high suicide rates. Uh, they experience their own trauma, which contributes to their bad behavior. We're doing some work now, but there's been other work in New York. Cops act more aggressive when their friends get hurt. And so also using this sort of network to say, holy cow, you know, John's, one of John's friends was just shot on the job. Maybe John should chill out for a little bit. Even small interventions like that can potentially uh, reduce harm or save lives. It does still kind of um, get there. What sort of mode of punishment? I mean, you do need to have a range because it really depends on what, um, you know, what we're talking about. Is it a cop? Uh, you know, the departmental side of things, the departmental complaints go from showing up to work drunk or engaging in a robbery, right? They can be a whole range of things as well. So obviously it really depends on what it is. I also do believe like most voters in this country after this election, that police accountability and oversight generally needs to be external to a department, um, right? Which is disciplining yourself becomes exceedingly difficult, especially given the relationship between many police unions and many police departments. So I actually don't think that those decisions, I think some things can be internal, uh, you know, whether it's a procedural violation or something like that, but I think some certain behaviors absolutely need to be uh, reviewed and held accountable externally to the department themselves. 
Okay, so then kind of looking at the the other end of the, the spectrum. So uh, an anonymous question, what do you think is necessary to uh, get willing change in law enforcement? What will make law enforcement accept these changes? Oh man, that is such a tough question because um, the current, I'm, let me just be very clear. I'm not anti-union. I was actually in the Massachusetts Teachers Union for 10 years. And before that, I was in a different union in Chicago. Um, I think the biggest obstacle for to get police willing to accept change is the current state of most police unions uh, and the strength of, of their collective bargaining agreement uh, and qualified immunity. So I think you see lots of individual officers who would readily accept many changes to policing, including stop doing things they don't want to do anyways. Like, so even when we talk about changing the size of police departments or reducing budgets, right? Like most of the behaviors that police are being asked to do, they don't actually want to do anyway. Um, but again, what that would mean would be shrinking the size of the police force, which would mean firing union employees. There's no way to have a conversation about defunding the police without talking about abolishing the police union. Um, because you just can't fire them. It doesn't work that easily. And in fact, if you were going to fire cops, you didn't, you'd it'd be the last in first out. You would fire the cops who are younger, probably more educated, probably more diverse. Uh, they would lose their jobs first. So getting willing uh, changes from the PD is really tricky. Uh, it actually doesn't matter. And, and here's what I mean by that. Um, you need to, I think we need to it, it get our conversations with legislators going first, because the easiest way to reduce, not the easiest way, probably one of the more effective ways to immediately reduce police abuses is to just tell them they can't do it anymore, <laughs> which is saying you are not going to arrest people for selling loose cigarettes. You are not going to write citations for, you know, panhandling. This is what you are going to do. And this is what you are not going to do. And that doesn't have to even happen with any union conversations. That is literally changing legislation, which is happening around the decriminalization of marijuana and other drugs around the country. Police will no longer be able to, they can one-on-one, -on -one, but then there is different legal repercussions for them. So I would say one of the things to think about departments willing or otherwise is of course, thinking of the external pressures that can be put on by legislation, which don't require uh, you know, the same sorts of things. We see this with consent decrees. Those are incredibly tricky uh, animals, uh, of course, which is like you have a court supervising it, the union pushes back, takes a really long time. I think Oakland's been under a consent decree for like 15 or 20 years at this point. But again, that's externally imposed on the police and they have to comply, um, as opposed to trying to change from within and say like, we're gonna do all that. that that's really difficult to do because people have different interests. But um, it would be great. I would love when I do talk with many officers, uh, you know, I would one time love for a police union to stand up and say, we admonish that behavior that does not represent our, our members. Uh, and, you know, we're going to kick this guy out of the union. I've never seen that happen ever. Uh, and so until you have that, I don't think the unions are serious about changing. Okay, we have another anonymous, anonymous question. Um, have you looked into how the war on terror or domestic surveillance infra infrastructure affects what police do and how they do it? Uh, I understand this question extends beyond day-to-day -day police conduct. conduct. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, in my other body of work, I, I use network analysis to figure out who's going to shoot whom, sort of neighborhood level violence, uh, group involved violence, gang involved violence. I've done this during prohibition era, Chicago. Um, you know, the issue with this technology um, is not that it doesn't do what it's supposed to do, it's, it's how it gets used. And so even when police monitor social media, um, you know, it, it's, it, it's going to be tainted from where they start. So police work on investigations, right? Police find some money that, you know, and John's work with social media and gangs can does this more from an academic perspective, which is what you would want. But what police do is they focus on Andy and his network, and then they build out. So guess what? Andy will always be the center, most important person at network, because that's where you started. If you look at our approach, I built it for the whole city. And then we started to zoom in, but we had, we had the population. That rarely happens when you use these tools. So these tools are built 
with this investigatory framework in mind and they tend to, to build around whatever initial seed or hunch um, that officers or police departments kind of kind of had. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a tricky sort of thing because especially where one of the tough conversations that has to happen around policing and contemporary society and what role, if any, it should play in public safety is, you know, even on campus at Northwestern, there's lots of protests happening around defund and, and abolish the police, especially right now, if you haven't been following it, there've been lots of high profile uh, back and forth with our president and this group. Um, what is your active shooter scenario on a campus with 22,000 people? You know, in a city like Chicago with O'Hare National Airport, you have to have a terrorism response. So, so how do we do that in a way that's fair and just? And here's the key word, transparent, right? Most times with these technologies, and in Chicago, there was, a, I can talk about this instance of the strategic subjects list. If nobody knows what's in the algorithms or nobody sees the technology, it's not fair or just or transparent, which means it's subject, highly subject to all sorts of abuses. And so I think where the technology is the concerned, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's less about the tech and really about how it gets used. I can make really good predictions on which people are gonna get shot in Chicago right now. It doesn't, but that doesn't matter if what we do is create a list and go arrest people because you don't, you shouldn't do that. So it's really balancing out what you do with the tech and that varies tremendously with police officer. Who are they using against? Peaceful protesters or actually terrorists? You know, who are representing a real threat. Okay, um, uh, Ruby has a question about uh, Blue Lives Matter. Uh, what is, you have any perspectives you'd like to share with us on uh, Blue Lives Matter? That's a that's not a, a loaded question. I I, I think it's um, ridiculous. I mean, I I let me just say it very clearly: Black Lives Matter, uh, and people that are flying a Blue Lives Matter flag are. Uh, are completely misguided. So are the cops that are wearing the Punisher logo um, and everything. Oh, the Punisher, for those of you that don't know the Punisher, it was like a vigilante that went out and killed a bunch of people extrajudiciously. Um, and so the cops that are doing that, you know, they're just buying the other end of, the, of a political spectrum. What some cops believe, not the ones that are likely to have that on their face mask or their truck, um, they want to feel, feel valued. Let me just be very clear. We have a, a project right now in Chicago where we've been following these neighborhood police officers, community residents, and, and less engaged community residents over the last two years. Cops want to be recognized as, as many cops, want to be recognized as civil servants, that they're doing this because they believe in it, that they actually, many cops believe that. And so the knee jerk reaction to, to something they don't understand is to say, well, we matter too. And by the way, this is the same thing with anybody who says all lives matter. That kind of missed the point of the Black Lives Matter movement. I say as an extremely privileged white dude. Um, but in the Blue Lives Matter context, what they're trying to express the solidarity uh, in a very small group mentality. And then it's just perverted and it misses the entire points. One of my students, Kayla Pareto Hodge, who just got a job at Rutgers, um, she studied uh, black police officers uh, during this moment of Black Lives Matter and how they are uh, wrestling with their own identity as black men, largely black men, um, who are, are on this current political moment. And what's interesting is then tra trading off, they have to decide in which situations do they trade off their blackness for their blueness to be to put it much more simply than, than Kayla would. Uh, and also recognizing that many of these black officers tend to lean more conservative uh, than the black population in general. So I think it's, it's pretty complicated, but I guess that's what I think about that. Thank you. Um, my colleague, Dr. Alyssa Cordner has put us both on the, on the, on the spot. She says, <laughs> wonderful talk. I have a question to Dr. Papakristos and John together. And how would we uh, see this innovative network analysis combining with other methods, methods, including qualitative methods? Um, John goes first. John goes. John has a, an answer for this because uh, uh, we're actually uh, doing this in a different context. Um, for the uh, so for I'll, I'll speak to um, the social media and gang stuff. So uh, 
um, we're combining network data I have on, on gangs with uh, police data uh, Dr. Papa Christos has on uh, shootings. And we're doing this, the, the network type thing. And we're, we're going deep into the qualitative components. So I'm, rather than just looking at the networks, I'm reading all the, the posts, I'm reading all the comments. And you'll have kind of the, the broader, the broader um, kind of uh, uh, network analysis of what's happening, how the network's changing when, you, when a violent act happens. But we'll also have the context behind it because you're kind of reading about the posts and the comments and, and the things that are happening uh, um, contextually as well. Um, and then applying that to, to uh, this, this research, um, I would imagine there's some kind of uh, 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 sticking with social media. I know I follow the, uh, uh, some social media pages that, that follow police violence and uh, they take videos and they, they share them on Facebook. I imagine there's some kind of context there that could be integrated here. Um, I'm not quite sure of that because I don't study that, but I'll let, I'll let you yeah. take over and answer better. No, I would just say what John said. I mean, I think in the context of policing, um, you know, what's interesting is there do not go, well, you can if you want, but um, there are many and plenty of cop blogs uh, and social media posts. And in fact, the current president of FOP in Chicago, John Catanzaro, actually lost his job, was actually fired and then reinstated for social media posts he had that making anti-Muslim comments while in uniform and posting the pictures. Uh, so yeah, there's a way we could do this. Um, cop blogs are way more anonymous than most young men who are gang members uh, posting about themselves, right? So there was also a case in New Haven, a city where I was for six or seven years, uh, where a retired, now retired New Haven police uh, officer now runs a nationally syndicated QAnon uh, podcast. So there's plenty of applications that could be done. Um, one of the trade-offs, and especially with different methods, and I often like to talk about this with, with John's description around social media and say gang members, really the sort of network stuff I do shows you the say highway system, right? Shows you the structure of the, of the highway and what the qualitative stuff shows you are essentially the rules of the road, uh, as well as the sorts of types of cars people drive, you know, which direction they're going. And so actually putting them together complements each other and gives you a much richer picture of the project, so. Okay, we have a couple, um, couple. Po po it's politics season, so a couple of <laughs> political questions. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, would you say that crime is complicated by bipartisan views? Uh, it's interesting to see how legislation is written and how it's uh, implicated uh, vulnerable groups. Just curious to hear your thoughts on how politics might intersect with all these topics. Uh, all of it. I mean, and it goes to the question above it for what do I think about Joe Biden's uh, rhetoric as well for Maddie. So the the history, I don't like the, the notion of anybody using the phrase law and order. Um, you know, I think I think there are two parts here, by the way. I think we need to separate crime and violence. Um, I, I think the the scale of things that we know about the war on drugs uh, the, and its impact are indisputable. Uh, I think we understand and we actually know a lot about what works and doesn't work in violence prevention. Um, doing more of what works and less of does, what doesn't work would be a huge step, would also require a smaller police force um, and a massive investment in a whole bunch of community-based strategies. So I think, I think that you know, it gets weaponized by politics in different ways, but goes back to the Willie Horton and the welfare queen, right? Which is using a specific instance to make a political point, to secure an election, to transfer funds or power to your, your, um, your constituents. And, and I think that happens in certain places in the margins uh, when we talk about things like ordinances or, or drug laws, I think the country is going to have to reckon with violence in a very different way. And Danielle Surratt has a wonderful book, and I think it's called Reckoning or something like that. But basically what she finds out is that even as we think about abolishing the, the prisons, or especially that movement and what's, what's happened in certain states, like once we whittle down prison populations to violent offenders, then we have to really ask ourselves, what do we do as a society with individuals um, who have caused serious harm to other people? Because actually we do not agree as a society about what we should do with them. 
Um, we don't agree within the same neighborhoods what we should do with them. And we sure as heck don't agree across neighborhoods what we should do with them. With my students this last week, we were talking about community safety and I wanted to remind people it actually man, what community are we talking about? George Zimmerman was part of a community neighborhood watch group, right? Uh, Kyle, the guy who shot Jacob Blake from Kenosha was defending what he believed to be his community with his illegal use of a firearm in his case. But there are plenty of people that are standing around there with firearms that that is their legal right. So we have to have a sense of getting, I don't know how you get past politics in this point. That's why I'm not a politician. But we do have to have a reckoning in this country with how we define violence and what we want to do with people who, who engage in those behaviors. The answer to that is not so simple. Um, and I do think, though, when we talk about other types of, I mean, loose cigarettes, selling CDs, like all those little things, failure to pay fines, basically criminalizing poverty, if we change that, that would be a massive win for this country. But we cannot ignore the fact that we have to, to really kind of do some deep searching and reckoning with, with what we believe we want to do with violent individuals uh, or who we deem violent. And, and just one example that's coming up and we're thinking about, my team is thinking about is, of course, um, uh, possession of gun laws, illegal possession of gun laws. People carry guns because they feel unsafe and they want to protect themselves. Is carrying a gun itself a violent crime? Or is it only a violent crime when you use that gun, stick it in somebody's face or rob somebody or shoot somebody? One could argue that just carrying a gun is a licensing problem, not a violent crime. Because certain people are legally allowed to carry guns. I believe in Philando Castile was allowed to carry a gun, right? People carry guns in public, at polling places, right? So where do we call and what do we call violent that it gets politicized, but we also, I think, have to have a minute and, and really think about that. I don't have any answers to that. I have, uh, I'm ready for my, my question now. Go um, for it. So close to home, we're here in, in Washington State, uh, right? I'm eight, eight, 10 miles from the Oregon border. Um, <clears throat> Oregon just passed legislation that uh, decriminalized all, all drugs. It, it, in my reading of the newspaper. Um, and you mentioned a couple things that, that I was just curious to hear your opinion on. Um, so legislative approaches, selling cigarettes, we shouldn't be uh, um, arresting people for selling cigarettes. That's, that creates kind of the, these opportunities for, for situations that happen. And my question is, um, uh, first, do you think that the, the just in, in general, decriminalizing all drugs in uh, um, Oregon will lead to decreases in, in uh, police violence, and then secondly, maybe more, not more importantly, but um, do you see this as, as trending? So if Oregon example shows us that this is okay, do you see it trending across states and, and then thereby kind of leading to a larger reduction in these types of incidents? So I'm not an expert in decriminalization, um, but you know, I can, I can put forward some hypothesis. Let me ask, let me just tell you the thing I do think comfortable, which is the question is, if we decriminalize, will it lead to fewer instances of police misconduct? The short answer to that is yes, right? So one of the greatest predictors of police complaints in any neighborhood or city or district or precinct is the volume of activity that police have with civilians. So the more often I stop someone for any reason, right, especially a contentious one, the more likely it's to lead to a bad outcome. So if I essentially reduce the reasons that I'm stopping people, by the way, reduce, not just supplant. So I don't just say, I'm not gonna stop you for drugs anymore, but now I'm gonna stop you for you know, baggy pants or a broken taillight. Um, to the desert, you, you reduce potentially conflictual uh, moments, encounters, you'll absolutely have fewer instances of police violence. I think that's true. In terms of will it spill over, I don't have the answer. Positive or negative, I have, I have no clue. Um, you know, I think some of the research suggests it probably won't have an effect you know, in terms of drugs going from Oregon to another state, although that, that could happen. But in general, in studies of like this, you see positive spillovers rather than negative ones. Um, but I don't actually, I don't have enough knowledge to kind of understand that. I do think if things go well in Oregon, you'll see other states trying to adapt similar laws. Um, but you'll probably start with states where it's easier to pass those laws. I don't, I don't think the sort of battleground flip states that happen will be the first to to adopt those laws. 
Great, thank you. Um, any last questions? Well, since we can't see folks, I, I will clap for everyone. Thank you for uh, taking the time and uh, coming to share your research with us. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Um, yeah. If I could, if I could chime in, John, thank you for organizing this wonderful talk. Uh, Andrew, thank you for your insights. Um, I'm a big fan of Chicago, and so it's always <laughs> wonderful to situate brilliant researchers and collaborations in a city that I love. So thank you. I just wanted to alert attendees that um, the search department has figured out at least three more presentations in the spring semester that align with the college's theme of race, violence, and health. Um, and we're not solidified on all the titles yet, but you can see that there's a lot of really fascinating crossover with uh, sociologists and environmental studies scholars working on crossovers between environmental justice and prisons, um, as well as race and the death penalty in Washington state. So you'll see more announcements from either Professor Laverso or me on various listers at Whitman. Um, and Andrew, thank you. This has been wonderful. Yeah. Thank and my, my uh, thanks to the three dozen or so students, colleagues, community members who attended. This has been really wonderful. Hope everybody stays safe and uh, enjoys whatever good weather is coming your way. Take care. Bye, all. See you, John. Bye. I'll see you on Friday. Yep. <laughs>